The human race has traveled a long way since those remote ages when men fashioned their rude implements of flint and lived on the precarious spoils of hunting, leaving to their children for their only heritage a shelter beneath the rocks, some poor utensils and nature vast, unknown, and terrific, with whom they had to fight for their wretched existence. During the long succession of agitated ages which have elapsed since, mankind has nevertheless amassed untold treasures and has cleared the land, dried the marshes, hewn down forests, made roads, pierced mountains. It has been building, inventing, observing, reasoning. It has created a complex machinery, wrested her secrets from nature, and finally it pressed steam and electricity into its service. And the result is that now the child of the civilized man finds at its birth, ready for its use, an immense capital, accumulated by those who have gone before him. And this capital enables man to acquire, merely by his own labor combined with the labor of others, riches surpassing the dreams of the fairy tales of Thousand and One Nights. The soil is cleared to a great extent, fit for the reception of the best seeds, ready to give a rich return for the skill and labor spent upon it, a return more than sufficient for all the wants of humanity. The methods of rational cultivation are known. On the wide prairies of America, each hundred men, with the aid of powerful machinery, can produce in a few months enough wheat to maintain 10,000 people for a whole year. And where man wishes to double his produce, to treble it, to multiply it, a hundredfold, he makes the soil, gives to each plant the re requisite care, and thus obtains enormous returns. While the hunter of old had to scour 50 or 60 square miles to find food for his family, the civilized man supports his household with, a f with far less pains and far more certainty on a thousandth part of the space. Climate is no longer an obstacle. When the sun fails, man replaces it by artificial heat, and we see the coming of a time when artificial light also will be used to stimulate vegetation. Meanwhile, by the use of glass and hot water pipes, man renders a given space 10 and 50 times more productive than it was in its natural state. The prodigies accomplished in, in, in industry are still more striking. With the cooperation of those intelligent beings, modern machines, themselves the fruit of three or four generations of, of inventors mostly unknown. A hundred men manufacture now the stuff to provide 10,000 persons with the clothing for two years. In well-managed coal mines, the labor of a hundred miners furnishes each year enough fuel to warm 10,000 families under an inclement sky. And we have lately witnessed the spectacle of wonderful cities springing up in a few months for international exhibitions without interrupting in the slightest degree the regular work of the nations. And if in manufactures as in agriculture, and as indeed through our whole social system, the labor, the discoveries, and the inventions of our ancestors profit chiefly the few, it is nonetheless certain that mankind in general, aided by the creatures of steel and iron which it already possesses, could already procure an existence of wealth and ease for every one of its members. Truly we are rich, far richer than we think rich in what we already possess, richer still in the possibilities of production of our actual mechanical outfit, richest of all in what we might win from our soil, from our manufactures, from our science, from our technical knowledge, where they but applied to bringing about the well-being of all. In our civilized societies, we are rich. Why then are the many poor? Why this painful drudgery for the masses? Why even to the best paid workmen this unnecessary, this uncertainty for the morrow? In the midst of all the wealth inherited from the past, and in spite of the powerful means of production, which could ensure a comfort to all in return for a few hours of daily toil. The socialists have said it and repeated it unwearingly. Daily they reiterate it, demonstrating it by arguments taken from all the sciences. It is because all that is necessary for production, the land, the mines, the highways, machinery, food, shelter, education, knowledge, all have been seized by the few in the course of that long story of robbery, enforced migration, and wars, of ignorance and oppression, which has been the life of the human race before it had learned to subdue the forces of nature. It is because, taking advantage of alleged rights acquired in the past, these few appropriate today two-thirds of the production of human labor, then squander it in the most stupid and shameful ways. It is because, having reduced the masses to a point at which they have not the means of subsistence for a month, 
or even for a week in advance, the few can allow the many to work, only on the condition of themselves receiving the lion's share. It is because these few prevent the remainder of men from producing the things they need and force them to produce, not the necessities of life for all, but whatever offers the greatest profits to the monopolists. And this is the substance of all socialism. Take indeed a civilized country. The forests which once covered have been cleared, the marshes drained, the climate improved. It has been made habitable. The soil, which bore formerly only a coarse vegetation, is covered today with rich harvests. The rock walls in the valleys are laid out in terraces and covered with vines. The wild plants, which yielded not but acrid berries or uneatable roots, have been transformed by generations of culture into succulent vegetables or trees covered with delicious fruits. Thousands of highways and railroads furrow the earth and pierce the mountains. The shriek of the engine is heard in the wild gorges of the Alps, the Caucasus, and the Himalayas. The rivers have been made navigable, the roads carefully surveyed are easy of access, artificial harbors laboriously dug out and protected against the fury of the sea afford shelter to the ships. Deep shafts have been sunk in the rocks. Labyrinth of un labyrinths of underground galleries have been dug out where coal may be raised or things of the highways great cities have sprung up and within their borders all the treasures of industry, science, and art have been accumulated. Whole generations that lived and died in misery, oppressed and ill-treated by their masters and worn out by toil, have handed on this immense inheritance to our century. For thousands of years, millions of men have labored to clear the forests, to drain the marshes, and to open up highways by land and water. Every root of soil we cultivate in Europe has been watered by the sweat of several races of men. Every acre has its story of enforced labor, of intolerable toil, of the people's sufferings. Every mile of railway, every yard of tunnel has received its share of human blood. The shafts of the mine still bear on their rocky walls the marks made by the pick of the workmen who toiled to excavate them. The space between each prop in the underground galleries might have been marked as a miner's grave. And who can tell what each of these graves has cost in tears, in privations, in unspeakable wretchedness to the family who depended on the scanty wages of the worker cut off in his prime by fire damp, rockfall, or flood? The cities bound together by railroads and waterways or organisms which have lived through centuries. Dig beneath them and you find, one above another, the foundations of streets, of houses, of theaters, of public buildings. Search into their history and you will see how the civilization of the town, its industry, its special characteristics, have slowly grown and ripened through the cooperation of generations of its inhabitants before it become, became what it is today. And even today, the value of each dwelling, factory, and warehouse, which has been created by the accumulated, accumulated labor of the millions of workers now dead and buried, is only maintained by the very presence of a labor of legions of the men who now inhabit that special corner of the globe. Each of the atoms composing what we call the wealth of nations owes its value to the fact that it is a part of the great whole. What would a London dockyard or a great Paris warehouse be if they were not situated in these great centers of international commerce? What would become of our mines, our factories, our workshops, and our railways without the immense quantities of merchandise traveled, transported every day by sea and by land? Millions of human beings have labored to create this civilization on which we pride ourselves today. Other millions scattered through the globe labor to maintain it. Without them, nothing would be left in 50 years but ruins. There is not even a thought or an invention which is not common property born of the past and the present. Thousands of inventors, known and unknown, who have died in poverty have cooperated in the invention of each of these machines which embody the genius of man. Thousands of writers, of poets, of scholars have labored to increase knowledge, to dissipate error, and to create that atmosphere of scientific, scientific thought without which the marvels of our century could never have appeared. And these thousands of philosophers, of poets and scholars, of inventors 
have themselves been supported by the labor of past centuries. They have been upheld and nourished through life, both physically and mentally, by legions of workers and craftsmen of all sorts. They have drawn their motive force from the environment. The genius of a Seguin, a Meyer, a Grove has certainly done more to launch industry in new directions than all the capitalists in the world. But men of genius are themselves the children of industry as well as of science. Not until thousands of steam engines had been working for years before all eyes, constantly transforming heat into dynamic force, and this force into sound, light, and electricity, could the insight of genius proclaim the mechanical origin and the unity of the physical forces. And if we, children of the 19th century, have at last grasped this idea, if we know now how to apply it, it is again because daily experience has prepared the way. The thinkers of the 18th century saw and declared it, but the idea remained undeveloped because the 18th century had not grown up like ours, side by side with the steam engine. Imagine the decades that might have passed while we remained in ignorance of this law, which has revolutionized modern industry, had Watt not found at Soho skilled workmen to embody his ideas in metal, bringing all the parts of his engine to perfection, so that steam, pent in a complete mechanism, and rendered more docile than a horse, more manageable than water, became at last the very soul of modern industry. Every machine has had the same history, a long record of sleepless nights and of poverty, of disillusions and of joys, of partial improvements discovered by several generations of nameless workers, who have added to the original invention these little nothings, without which the most fertile idea would remain fruitless. More than that, every new invention is a synthesis, the resultant of innumerable inventions which have preceded it in the vast field of mechanics. And industry. Science and industry, knowledge and application, discovery and practical realization leading to new discoveries, cunning of brain and of hand, toil of mind and muscle, all work together. Each discovery, each advance, each increase in the sum of human riches owes its being to the physical and mental travail of the past and the present. By what right, then, can any one whatever appropriate the least morsel of this immense whole and say, this is mine, not yours. It has come about, however, in the course of the ages traversed by the human race, that all that enables man to produce and to increase his power of production has been seized by the few. Sometime, perhaps, we will relate how this came to pass. For the present, let it suffice to state that fact, that fact, and analyze its consequences. Today, the soil, which actually owes its value to the needs of an ever-increasing population, belongs to a minority who prevent the people from cultivating it, or do not allow them to cultivate it according to modern methods. The mines, though they represent the labor of several generations and derive their sole value from the requirements of the industry of a nation and the density of the population, the mines also belong to the few, and these few restrict the output of coal or prevent it entirely if they find more profitable investments for their capital. Machinery too has become the exclusive property of the few, and even when a machine incontestably represents the improvements added to the original rough invention by three or four generations of workers, it nonetheless belongs to a few owners. And if the descendants of the very inventor who constructed the first machine for lace making a century ago were to present themselves today in a lace factory at Vale or Nottingham and claim their rights, they would be told, hands off, this machinery is not yours, and they would be shot down if they attempted to take possession of it. The railways, which would be useless as so much old iron without the teeming population of Europe, its industry, its commerce, its marts, belong to a few shareholders, ignoring perhaps the whereabouts of the lines of rails which yield them revenues greater than those of medieval kings. And if the children of those who perished by thousands while excavating the railway cuttings and tunnels were to assemble one day, crowding in their rags and hunger, to demand bread from their shareholders, they would be met with bayonets and grape shot to disperse them and safeguard quote-unquote vested interests. In virtue of this monstrous system, the son of the worker on entering life finds no field which he may till, no machine which he may tend, no mine in which he may dig, without accepting to leave a great part of what he will produce to a master. 
he must sell his labor for a scant and uncertain wage. His father and his grandfather have toiled to drain this field, to build this mill, to perfect this machine. They gave the work the full measure of their strength, and what more could they give? But the heir comes into the world poorer than the lowest person. If he obtains leave to till the fields, it is on condition of surrendering a quarter of the produce to his master, and another quarter to the government and the middlemen. And this tax, levied upon him by the state, the capitalist, the lord of the manor, and the middleman, is always increasing. It rarely leaves him the power to improve his system of culture. If he turns to industry, he is allowed to work, though not always even that, only on condition that he yield a half or two-thirds of the product to him whom the land recognizes as the owner of the machine. We cry shame on the feudal baron who forbade the peasant to turn a clod of earth unless he surrendered to his lord a fourth of his crop. We called those the barbarous times. But if the forms have changed, the relations have remained the same, and the worker is forced, under the name of free contract, to accept feudal obligations. For turn where he will, he can find no better conditions. Everything has become private property, and he must accept or die of hunger. The result of this state of things is that our production tends in a wrong direction. Enterprise takes no thought for the needs of the community. Its only aim is to increase the gains of the speculator. Hence the constant fluctuations of trade, the periodical industrial crises, each of whom throws scores of thousands of workers on the street. The working people cannot purchase with their wages the wealth which they have produced, and industry seeks foreign markets among the moneyed classes of other nations. In the East, in Africa, everywhere, in Europe, Tonkin, or Congo, the European is thus bound to promote the growth of serfdom. And so he does. But soon he finds that everywhere there are similar competitors. All the nations evolve on the same lines, and wars, perpetual wars, break out for the right of precedence in the market. Wars for the possession of the East, wars for the empire of the sea, wars to impose duties on imports and to dictate conditions to neighboring states. Wars against those blacks who revolt. The roar of the cannon never ceases in the world. Whole races are massacred. The states of Europe spend a third of their budgets in armaments, and we know how heavily these taxes fall on the workers. Education still remains the privilege of a, sm of a small minority, for it is idle to talk of education when the workman's child is forced, at the age of 13, to go down into the mine or to help his father on the farm. It is idle to talk of studying to the worker, who comes home in the evening wearied by excessive toil and its brutalizing atmosphere. Society is thus bound to remain divided into two hostile camps, and in such conditions freedom is a vain word. The radical begins by demanding a greater extension of political rights, but he soon sees that the breath of liberty leads to the uplifting of the proletariat, and he turns around, changes his opinions, and reverts to repressive legislation and government by the sword. A vast array of courts, judges, executioners, policemen, and gaolers are needed to uphold these privileges, and this array gives rise in its whole to a whole system of espionage, of false witness, of spies, of threats, and corruption. The system which under we live checks in its turn the growth of the social sentiment. We all know that without uprightness, without self-respect, without sympathy and mutual aid, humankind must perish, as perish the few races of animals living by rapine or the slave-keeping ants. But such ideas are not to the taste of the ruling classes, and they have elaborated a whole system of pseudoscience to teach the contrary. Fine sermons have been preached on the text that those who should share with those who have not. But he who would carry out this principle would be speedily informed that these beautiful sentiments are all very well in poetry, but not in practice. To lie is to degrade and besmirch oneself, we say, and yet all civilized life becomes one huge lie. We accustom ourselves and our children to hypocrisy, to the practice of double-faced morality. And since the brain is ill at ease among lies, we cheat ourselves with sophistry. Hypocrisy and sophistry become the second nature of the civilized man. But a society cannot live thus. It must return to truth or cease to exist. Thus the consequences which spring from the original act of monopoly spread through the whole of social life. 
Under pain of death, human societies are forced to return to first principles. The means of production being the collective work of humanity, the product should be the collective property of the race. Individual appropriation is neither just nor serviceable. All belongs to all. All things are for all men, since all men have needed them. Since all men have worked in the measure of their strength to produce them, and since it is not possible to evaluate everyone's part in the production of the world's wealth. All things for all. Here is an immense stock of tools and implements. Here are all these iron slaves, which we call mach machines, which saw and plane, spin and weave for us, unmaking and remaking, working up raw matter to produce marvels of our time. But nobody has the right to seize a single one of these machines and say, this is mine. If you want to use it, you must pay me a tax on each of your products. Any more than the feudal lord of medieval times had the right to say to the peasant, this hill, this meadow belongs to me, and you must pay me a tax on every sheaf of corn you reap, on every brick you build. All is for all. If the man and the woman bear their fair share of work, they have a right to their fair share of all that is produced by all, and that share is enough to secure them well-being. No more of such vague formulas as the right to work, or to each of the whole result of his labor. What we must proclaim is the right to well-being, well-being for all. Well-being for all is not a dream. It is possible, realizable, owing to all that our ancestors have done to increase our powers of production. We know, indeed, that the producers, although they const constitute hardly one-third of the inhabitants of the civilized countries, even now produce such quantities of goods that a certain degree of comfort could be brought to every hearth. We know further that if all those who squander today the fruits of others' toil were forced to employ their leisure in useful work, our wealth would increase in proportion to the number of producers and more. Finally, we know that contrary to the theory enunciated by Malthus, that oracle of middle-class economics, the productive powers of the human race increase at a much more rapid ratio than its powers of reproduction. The more thickly men are crowded into the soil, the more rapid is the growth of their wealth-creating power. Thus, although the population of England has only increased from 1844 to 1890 by 62%, its production has grown, even at the lowest estimate, at double that rate, to wit by 130%. In France, where the population has grown more slowly, the increase in production is nevertheless very rapid. Notwithstanding the crises through which agriculture is frequently passing, notwithstanding state interference, the blood tax, i.e. conscription, and speculative commerce and finance, the production of wheat in France has increased fourfold, and industrial production more than tenfold in the course of the last 80 years. In the United States, this progress is still more striking. In spite of immigration, or rather precisely because of the influx of surplus European labor, the United States have multiplied their wealth tenfold. However, these figures give but a very faint idea of what our wealth might become under better conditions. For alongside the rapid development of our wealth producing powers, we have an overwhelming increase in the ranks of the idlers and middlemen. Instead of capital gradually concentrating itself into a few hands so that it would only be necessary for the community to dispossess a few millionaires and enter upon its lawful heritage, instead of this socialist forecast proving true, the exact reverse is coming to pass. The swarm of parasites is ever increasing. In France, there are not 10 actual producers to every 30 inhabitants. The whole agricultural wealth of the country is the work of less than seven millions of men, and in the two great industries, mining and the textile trades, you will find that the workers number less than two and a half 
less than two and one half millions. But the exploiters of labor, how many are they? In the United Kingdom, a little over one million workers, men, women, and children, are employed in the textile trades. Less than 900,000 work the mines. Much less than two million till the ground. And it appeared from the last industrial census that only a little over four million men, women, and children were employed in all of the industries. So the, the, the statisticians have to exaggerate all the figures in order to establish a maximum of 8 million producers to 45 million inhabitants. Strictly speaking, the creators of the goods exported from Britain to all the ends of the earth comprise only from 6 to 7 million workers. And what is the number of the shareholders and middlemen who levy the first fruits of labor from far and near and heap up unearned gains by thrusting themselves between the producer and the consumer? Nor is this all. The owners of capital constantly reduce the output by restraining production. We need not speak of the cartloads of oysters thrown into the sea to prevent a dainty hitherto reserved for the rich uh, from becoming a food for the people. We need not speak of the thousand and one luxuries, stuffs, foods, etc., etc., treated after the same fashion. Remember the way in which the production of the most necessary things is limited. Legions of miners are ready and willing to dig coal out every day and send it to those who are shivering with cold. But too often, a third or even one half of their numbers are forbidden to work more than three days a week. Because, forsooth, the price of coal must be kept up. Thousands of weavers are forbidden to work the looms, although the wives and children go in rags, and although three-quarters of the population of Europe have no clothing worthy of the name. Hundreds of blast furnaces, thousands of factories periodically stand idle, others only work half-time, and in every civilized nation there is a permanent population of about two million individuals who ask only for work, work is denied. How gladly would these millions of men set to work to reclaim wastelands or to transform ill-cultivated lands into fertile fields or rich in harvests? A year of well-directed toil would suffice to multiply fivefold the produce of those millions of acres in this country, which lie idle now as permanent pasture. Or of those dry lands in the south of France, which now yield only about eight bush bushels of wheat per acre, but men, who would be happy to become hardy pioneers in so many branches of wealth-producing activity, must remain idle because the owners of the soil, the mines, and the factories prefer to invest their capital taken in the first place from the community in Turkish or Egyptian bonds or in Patagonian gold mines and so make Egyptian fellas, Italian Im uh, immigrants and Chinese coolies their wage slaves. This is the direct and deliberate limitation of production. But there is also a limit and limitation indirect and not of set purpose, which consists in spending human toil on objects absolutely useless or destined only to satisfy the dull vanity of the rich. It is impossible to reckon in figures the extent to which wealth is restricted indirectly, the extent to which energy is squandered while it might have served to produce, and above all to prepare the machinery necessary to production. It is enough to cite the immense sums spent by Europe in armaments for the sole purpose of acquiring control of markets, and so forcing her own goods on neighboring territories and making exploitation easier at home. The millions paid every year to officials of all sorts whose function it is to maintain the quote-unquote rights of minorities, the right, that is, of a, rich, a few rich men to manipulate the economic activities of the nation. The millions spent on judges, prisons, policemen, and all the paraphernalia of so-called justice, spent to no purpose because we know that every alleviation, however slight, of the wretchedness of our great cities is always followed by a considerable diminution of crime. Lastly, the millions spent on propagating pernicious doctrines by means of the press and news, cooked in the interest of this or that party, of this politician, or of that group of speculators. But over and above this, we must take into account all the labor that goes to sheer waste. Here, in keeping up the stables, the kennels, and the retinue of the rich, there, in pandering to the caprices of society and the depraved tastes of the fashionable mob, there, again, in forcing the consumer to buy what he does not need, or foisting an inferior article upon him by means of puffery, and in producing, on the other hand, wares which are absolutely injurious, but profitable to the manufacturer, 
What is squandered in this manner would be enough to double the production of useful things, or so to plenish all our mills and factories with the machinery that they would soon flood the shops with all that is now lacking to two-thirds of the nation. Under our present system, a full quarter of the producers in every nation are forced to be idle for three to four months in the year, and the labor of another quarter, if not of the half, has no better results than the amusement of the rich or the exploitation of the public. Thus, if we consider, on the one hand, the rapidity with which civilized nations augment their powers of production, and on the other hand, the limits set to that production be it directly or indirectly, by existing conditions, we cannot but conclude that an economic system a trifle more reasonable would permit them to heap up in a few years so many useful products that they would be constrained to say, enough, we have enough coal and bread and raiment, let us rest and consider how to best use our powers, how to best employ our leisure. No, plenty for all is not a dream though it was a dream indeed in those days when man, for all his pains, could hardly win a few bushels of wheat from an acre of land, and had to fashion by hand all the implements he used in agriculture and industry. Now it is no longer a dream, because man has invented a motor which, with a little iron and a few sacks of coal, gives him the mastery of a creature strong and docile as a horse, and capable of setting the most complicated machinery in motion." But, if plenty for all is to become a reality, this immense capital, cities, houses, pastures, arable lands, factories, highways, education, must cease to be regarded as private property for the monopolist to dispose of at his pleasure. This rich endowment, painfully won, builded, fashioned, or invented by our ancestors, must become common property, so that the collective interests of men may gain from it the greatest food for all. There must be expropriation, the well-being of all, the end, expropriation, the means. Expropriation, such then, is the problem which history has put before the men of the 20th century. The return to communism and all that ministers to the well-being of man. But this problem cannot be solved by means of legislation. No one imagines that. The poor as well as the rich understand that neither the existing governments nor any which might arise out of possible political changes would be capable of finding such a solution. They feel the necessity of a social revolution, and both rich and poor recognize that this revolution is imminent, and that it may break out in a few years. A great change in thought has taken place during the last half of the 19th century. But suppressed as it was by the property classes and denied its natural development, this new spirit must now break its bonds by violence and realize itself in a revolution. Whence will the revolution come? How will it announce its coming? No one can answer these questions. The future is hidden. But those who watch and think do not misinterpret the signs. Workers and exploiters, revolutionists and conservatives, thinkers and men of action all feel that a revolution is at our doors. Well then, what are we to do when the thunderbolt has fallen? We have all been bent on studying the dramatic side of revolutions so much, and the practical work of revolutions so little, that we are apt to see only the stage effects, so to speak, of these great movements. The fight of the first days, the barricades. But this fight, this first skirmish, is soon ended, and it only after the breakdown of the old system and that the real work of the revolution can be said to begin. Effete and powerless, attacked on all sides, the old rulers are soon swept away by the breath of insurrection. In a few days, the middle-class monarchy, monarchy of 1848 was no more. And while Louis Philippe was making good his escape in a cab, Paris had already forgotten her quote-unquote citizen king. The government of tears disappeared on the 18th of March, 1871, in a few hours, leaving Paris mistress of her destinies. Yet 1848 and 1871 were only insurrections. Before a popular revolution, the masters of the quote-unquote old, the old order disappeared with a surprising rapidity. Its upholders fly the country to plot and safety elsewhere and to devise measures for their return. The former government having disappeared, the army, hesitating before the tide of popular opinion, no longer obeys its commanders, who have also prudently decamped. 
The troops stand by without interfering, or join the rebels. The police, standing at ease, are uncertain whether to belabor the crowd or to cry, Long live the commune, while some retire to their quarters to await the pleasure of the new government. Wealthy citizens pack their trunks and betake themselves to places of safety. The people remain. This is how a revolution is ushered in. In several large towns, the commune is proclaimed. In the streets wander scores of thousands of men, and in the evening they crowd into imp improvised clubs, asking, What shall we do? And ardently discuss public affairs. All take an interest in them. Those who yesterday were quite indifferent are perhaps the most zealous. Everywhere there is a plenty of goodwill, and a keen desire to make victory certain. It is a time when acts of supreme devotion are occurring. The masses of the people are full of the desire of going forward. All this is splendid, sublime, but still it is not a revolution. Nay, it is only now the work of the revolution begins. Doubtless there will be acts of vengeance. The Watrons and the Thomases will pay the penalty of their unpopularity, but these are mere incidents of the struggle, not the revolution. Socialist politicians, radicals, neglected geniuses of journalism, stump orators, both middle-class people and workmen will hurry to the town hall, to the government offices to take position of the vacant seats. Some will decorate themselves with gold and silver lace to their heart's content, admire themselves in ministerial mirrors, and study to give orders with an air of importance appropriate to their new position. How could they impress their comrades of the office or the workshop without having a red sash, an embroidered cap, and magisterial gestures? Others will bury themselves in official papers, trying with the best of wills to make head or tail of them. They will indict laws and issue high-flown worded decrees that nobody will take the trouble to carry out, because revolution has come. To give themselves an authority which they have not, they will seek the sanction of old forms of government. They will take the names of provisional government, or committee of public safety, mayor, governor of the town hall, commission of public safety, and what not. Elected or acclaimed, they will assemble in boards or in communal councils where men of 10 or 20 different schools will come together representing not as many private chapels, as is often said, but as many different conceptions regarding the scope, the bearing, and the goal of the revolution. Possibilists, collectivists, radicals, Jacobins, blankists will be thrust together and waste time in wordy warfare. Honest men will be huddled together with the ambitious ones whose only dream is power and who spurn the crowd whence they are sprung. All coming together with diametrically opposed views, all forced to enter into ephemeral alliances in order to create majorities that can but last a day. Wrangling, calling each other reactionaries, authoritarians, and rascals, incapable of coming to an understanding on any serious measure, dragged into discussions about trifles, producing nothing better than bombastic proclamations, all giving themselves an awful importance while the real strength of the movement is in the streets. All this may please those who like the stage, but it is not revolution. Nothing has been accomplished as yet. And meanwhile, the people suffer. The factories are idle. The workshops are closed. Trade is at a standstill. The worker does not even earn the meager wage which was his before. Food goes up in price, with that heroic devotion which has always characterized them, and which in great crises reaches the sublime. The people will wait patiently. We place three months of want at the service of the Republic, they said in 1848, while their representatives and, gen and gentlemen of the new government, down to the meanest jack in office, received their salary regularly. The people suffer with the childlike faith, with the good humor of the masses who believe in their leaders. They think that yonder in the house, in the town hall, in the committee of public safety, that their welfare is being considered. But yonder they are discussing everything under the sun except the welfare of the people. In 1793, while famine ra ravaged France and crippled the revolution, whilst the people were reduced to the depths of misery, although the champ Elies were lined with luxurious carriages where women displayed their jewels and splendor, Robespierre was urging the Jacobins to discuss his treatise on the English Constitution. While the worker was suffering in 1848 from the general stoppage of trade, the provisional government and the National Assembly were wrangling over military pensions and prison labor without troubling how the people managed to live during the terrible crisis. 
And could one cast your approach at the Paris Commune, which was born beneath the Prussian cannon, cannon and lasted only 70 days, it would be for this same error, this failure to understand that the revolution could not triumph unless those who fought on its side were fed, that on 15 pence a day, a man cannot fight on the ramparts and at the same time support a family. It seems to us that there is only one answer to this question. We must recognize and loudly pro proclaim that everyone, whatever his grade in the old society, whether strong or weak, capable or incapable, has before everything the right to live, and that society is bound to share amongst all, without exception, the means of existence it has at its disposal. We must acknowledge this and proclaim it aloud and act up to it. Affairs must be managed in such a way that from the first day of the revolution, the worker shall know that a new era is opening before him, that henceforth none need crouch under bridges while palaces are hard by. None need fast in the midst of plenty. None need perish with cold near shops full of furs, that all is for all in practice as well as in theory, and that at last, for the first time in history, a revolution has been accomplished which considers the needs of the people before schooling them in their duties. This cannot be brought about by acts of parliament, but only by taking immediate and effective possession of all that is necessary to ensure the well-being of all. This is the only really scientific way of going to work the only way which can be understood and desired by the mass of the people. We must take possession in the name of the people, of the granaries, the shops full of clothing, and the dwelling houses. Nothing must be wasted. We must organize without delay a way to feed the hungry, to satisfy all wants, to meet all needs, to bruise not for the special benefit of this one or that one, but so as to ensure the society as a whole its life and further development. Enough of ambiguous words like the right to work, with which the people were misled in 1848, and which are still resorted to with the hope of misleading them. Let us have the courage to recognize that well-being for all, henceforth possible, must be realized. When the workers claimed the right to work in 1848, national and municipal governments were organized, and workmen were sent to drudge there at the rate of 1S8D a day. I'm not sure what that is. That's some kind of... It's probably very little money. When they asked the organization of labor, the reply was, Patience, friends. The government will see to it. Meanwhile, here's your meager amount of money. Rest now, brave toiler, after your lifelong struggles for food. And in the meantime, the cannons were overhauled. The reserves were called out and the workers themselves disorganized by the many methods well known to the middle classes till one fine day in June, 1848. Four months after the overthrow of the previous government, they were told to go and colonize Africa or be shot down. Very different will be the result if the workers claim the right to well-being. In claiming that right, they claim the right to take possession of the wealth of the community to take houses to dwell in according to the needs of each family, to socialize the stores of food and learn the meaning of plenty after having known famine too well. They proclaim their right to all social wealth, fruit of the labor of past and present generations, and learn by its means to enjoy those higher pleasures of art and science which have too long been monopolized by the rich. And while asserting their right to live in comfort, they assert what is still more important, their right to decide for themselves what this comfort shall be, what must be produced to ensure it, and what discarded as no longer of value. The right to well-being means the possibility of living like human beings, and of bringing up our children to be members of a society better than ours, 
whilst the right to work only means the right to always be a wage slave, a drudge, ruled over and exploited by the middle class of the future. The right to well-being is the social revolution. The right to work means nothing but the treadmill of commercialism. It is high time for the workers to assert this right to the common inheritance and to enter into possession of it.